Welcome to Angels and Seer Stones. I'm Christine. And I'm Chris. Okay, first things first. This is a new podcast and we're eager to build up those subscriptions, so please subscribe. So very eager. Please subscribe. Today we're talking about a set of relics associated with the martyrdom of Joseph Smith that are commonly called casket canes or coffin canes, sometimes martyrdom canes. It'll lead us in exciting directions as we talk about sacred objects and the legends that emerge from them. Latter-day Saints are a people of radical faith. We are a unique body of Bible-believing Christians. For us, the scriptural canon has been opened. The traditional sacraments have expanded. Our beliefs and practices are steeped in universalism, esotericism, and apocalypticism. The Latter-day Saint tradition is a religion in which angels visit everyday people, and sometimes men and women see the divine in stones. In this podcast, we examine the lived religion of Latter-day Saints, the stories we tell, and the beliefs we debate. We take seriously the whole gambit of Latter-day Saint experience. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Angels and Seer Stones. So what are these coffin canes? These canes came from the planks that carry Joseph and Hiram's bodies back from the site of their murders in Carthage, Illinois, to their homes in Nauvoo. Afterwards, several of their close friends divided the blood-stained boards into sticks for canes. Some people kept these just the way they were, but others had them shaped into more traditional canes and placed a knob on the top. And in really elaborate cases, they took some of Joseph and Hiram's hair and they held it in place by a piece of glass that they had taken from the viewing screen that covered the brothers' faces while they were laid in state in the mansion house. Yeah, and as we'll discuss, some early Latter-day Saints placed a great deal of religious significance on these canes. They believed they could actually perform, they could work miracles. That's right, but before we get too far, talking about the canes themselves, let's look at the tradition of sacred objects among Latter-day Saints. Remember, when Moroni finally gave Joseph Smith the gold plates that contained the Book of Mormon, it was in a box that also held the sort of Laban, the Urim and Thummim, and the Liahona. These weren't only sacred items to be revered, they held supernatural power. The Urim and Thummim, like other seer stones, provided visionary sight. The Liahona was like a divinatory compass that led Lehi and his family towards the promised land. Right, and as you mentioned, we have the Sword of Laban that, according to the story of Brigham Young, was connected to last day prophecies. And it's not just 19th century history. Right. Latter-day Saints are reading the Bible. You know, Moses had a staff that could turn into a serpent, bring water out of a mm-hmm. rock. And it was even used to part the Red Sea. So as we start this episode, keep these other objects in mind. Yeah, I think this is really important. When I tell my students about the martyrdom canes, and I always tell my students about the martyrdom canes, they can sometimes be weirded out by the idea that we have relics, that we would think a board with some of Joseph's blood might have power attached to it. Um, But when we keep in mind this entire history of sacred objects, I don't think it becomes that strange at all. I think it's in continuity. It's much like these older stories. Okay, but we should also keep in mind that um, these canes were also used simply as artifacts to remember Joseph and Hiram. In Sam Brown's book, In Heaven As It Is On Earth, he talks about how these objects are surrogates of Joseph and Hiram's presence. You know, people keep items to remember their loved ones by when they pass. That's absolutely right. I think Sam Brown does a wonderful job talking about that in the book. It's one of my favorite books, in fact. You know, these canes quickly became more than reminders of Joseph and Hiram. They became personal relics possessing some of Hiram and Joseph's power. That's right. And the canes were treated with great reverence by Latter-day Saints. Um, We have this wonderful excerpt from Heber C. Kimball, who was a member of the First Presidency. And this excerpt comes from March 15th, 1857. Let's roll it. How much would you give for even a cane that Father Abraham had used? Or a coat or ring that the Savior had worn? The rough oak boxes in which the bodies of Joseph and Hiram were brought from Carthage were made into kings and other articles. I have a cane made for the plank of one of those boxes. So has Brother Brigham and a great many others. We prize them highly and esteem them a great blessing. I want to carefully preserve my cane, and when I am done with it here, I shall hand it down to my heir with instructions for him to do the same. 
And a day will come when there will be multitudes who will be healed and blessed with it through the instrumentality of those canons. And the devil cannot overcome those who have them, the consequence of their faith and confidence in the virtues can There's a lot to say about Heber C. Kimball's cane, and we'll come back to that. We wanted to share this excerpt from his sermon because it lays out his expectations for all of these canes. Yeah, I love the way Heber relates the canes to ancient prophets. It's true. A, a ring from Abraham is an idea he's setting it into this old scriptural past. So Heber says that the cane is a conduit of healing and that it also has power over Satan. Heber will compare the cane's healing properties to a handkerchief that was blessed by Joseph Smith and brought to people when they were sick. It held some of that priesthood authority, that sacredness that people associated with Joseph that could actually be transported remotely through an object. Yeah, that's so fascinating. While we can't say too much or really anything about how these canes were used to combat evil spirits, although I wish we could, we can document how these canes are being used for healing. Heber C. Kimball tells us this, but we also have other Latter-day Saints who own martyrdom canes that talk about it. One man recalled his mother even sleeping with the family cane to help ease her back pain. And while it's not really appropriate to discuss this in any detail here, or at least tell you who this individual was, this is a, an example of how those canes are still being used, that they are being used widely within the family. Yeah, we're, I'm aware of at least two different people who share their canes with others for healing yeah. properties even, even in the 2000s so i'm interested in hebrew signals plans to pass the cane down to an heir the idea of a birthright heir comes from the story of abraham and isaac in genesis and among early latter-day saints these heirs had responsibilities that go way beyond just an inheritance um, an heir was someone who would act for you in the temple so after your death if someone wanted to be sealed to you they would serve as your proxy um, they'd also keep track of family temple work so um Today, we have family search, and everybody keeps track of which ancestors had which ordinances performed for them. But if you look at these early temple records, if a family member wanted to perform a baptism for the dead for someone, they would have the heir sign off on it. He would keep track of who still needs ordinances in the family. Yeah, it's really fascinating. So the story of Heber C. Kimball takes a strange turn after Heber's death when two of his lines would claim that they'd both been given the martyrdom cane. The first of this was Abraham Alonzo Kimball, and he was the son of a daughter of Alpheus Cutler. And Alpheus Cutler, of course, was a prominent leader in Nauvoo who would eventually start his own church in, in Iowa. But Abraham joined the LDS church as a teen after a trip to Utah. While he had a wonderful relationship with his dad, Abraham wasn't officially appointed as the heir, but believed that he had been because he was in possession of the cane. In 1882, Wilford Woodruff, with the support of John Taylor, who was the president of the church, approached Abraham to be recognized as his heir. He gave Abraham a kind of, um, you know, patriarchal blessing, which he recorded in his journal. And this is what Abraham wrote. He laid his hands upon my head and commenced blessing me, setting me apart as heir to my father's house, saying I was called before the foundation of this earth to come down in this dispensation and take up the work where my father had left it, that it was my place and that I should have power to accomplish it and that the devil should not overcome me that my father's house should be represented through me and my posterity through time and all eternity, that patriarchs, prophets, angels, and my father had watched over me and would continue to do so through my faithfulness, sealing me up unto eternal life, adding that I would be called into other positions, sealing all the blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that I might have health and strength, sealing all the blessings of the new and everlasting covenant upon me, giving my lineage of Ephraim direct through the loins of Joseph, and promising that I should have thrones, dominions, and powers. Powerful blessing. Uh, later, John Taylor called all of Heber's sons to a meeting. He first asked the eldest son if he would take the position as his heir, but he declined. And Taylor then suggested Abraham, and of course, all the other brothers agreed. And this might have been something to do with him being a bishop who was living plural marriage. The fact that Abraham was the proper heir was announced in the 1880 book, uh, 1888 book, excuse me, The Life of Heber C. Kemble, which the family then uh, later published. Right. One of the things they say in that book is just a little footnote that says Abraham has been given the cane and it still has these healing properties attached to it. Heber's second alleged martyrdom cane passed down through another son, David P. Kemble, and then to David's son, Heber Chase Kemble. Chase, as he was known at the time, became a Mormon fundamentalist, along with his brother, Quince Kimball. 
Quince was a state senator and a public figure, and we're very fortunate to have a letter that he wrote to the fundamentalist newspaper Truth. And this is what he said. I want to say the cane owned by my grandfather, which seems to be in question, belongs to my brother, Heber Chase Kimball, without any argument. Violet is his grandmother, the first wife of Heber C. Kimball, a real queen among the group and loved more by her husband than any other wife he had, who went through all of the sorrows from Kirtland, Missouri, Illinois, and crossing the plains to Utah. She, she gave birth to ten children, and it's not likely, in the patriarchal order of things, that the cane that had so much value would go to a lady, wife, whose parents apostatized from the church. And she never had faith enough to follow her husband to Utah and had only one child, whom I have nothing but the greatest regard for. And his name is not Heber Chase. He would not be the heir and owner of the cane. Heber Chase Kimball, the first son who received the name of his grandfather, is the first child of the third generation to receive the full name. And I want to say this, that no man whom I ever saw has more faith in a gift of that kind than the boy I have just mentioned. The David P. Kimball cane, that is the cane given from Heber C. Kimball to David P. Kimball to Heber Chase Kimball, was then handed down to Heber's stepson, Chase's stepson, Ed Alder, who would have been the third man to possess the cane. Ed was also a fundamentalist. He believed that each cane signified heirship, and so Brigham Young's cane passed down in the Brigham Young family, as appointing each son that would become heir, the Oliver Huntington cane would do the same, and so on. He tried to rationalize that the reason there were two canes in the Kimball family was that while his represented the heirship of Heber C. Kimball, that his cousin's cane, Abraham Alonzo Kimball, also a descendant of Alpheus Cutler, actually represent, represented the Alpheus Cutler line. So you can see how kind of material culture or these sacred objects begin to set a stage for legends to develop. You know, there are three theories that Latter-day Saints have held surrounding the significance of these canes. First was suggested by Raymond Taylor, the grandson of John Taylor, and he believed that the canes were given to a group of men who had made an oath to avenge the murders of Joseph and Hiram in Nauvoo. It's kind of an interesting and scary interpretation of the canes. Yeah. A second theory was proposed by Howard Carlos Smith, a descendant of Joseph Bates Noble, Bates Noble also handed down a martyrdom cane to his descendants. Howard Carlos Smith believed that Emma Hale Smith, the prophet's widow, unrelated to Howard Carlos, had given the canes of 12 men representing the 12 tribes of Israel. The final theory, and probably my favorite, was given by Ed Elder, who believed there were seven canes that had been passed down to seven men and were connected to a special angelic visitation that had occurred in the Nauvoo Temple before the Exodus. Of course, none of these ideas received wide circulation among the saints, and none were backed up with historical evidence. Right. It shows how an artifact can inspire stories, how artifacts are conduits for speculation and tradition. And these stories develop, like all stories do. In this case, here's a set of artifacts designed to remind the saints of Joseph and Hiram Smith. In Utah, initially, they were believed to have special powers in the canes. And in response to Heber C. Kimball's sermon we looked at earlier, it was assumed that those who would possess these items were themselves special. And thus we see all this speculation surrounding the groups. Why are these men given these canes? What's the significance of each of them? Yeah, and something I want to point out is that these canes or these heirlooms, personal relics, they become a part of this family lore. And the family lore is something we're going to talk a lot about on the podcast, but this is a pretty cool Absolutely. example. It sure is. Listeners, do you want to see one of these martyrdom canes? A few remain in private hands. Um, in fact, earlier this year, Christine and I had the opportunity to hold one of these canes. It was a really powerful experience. It was awesome. There are four canes on display in Salt Lake City, though, and we recommend you visit them. So there are two at the Daughters of the Utah Pioneer Museum. One came into the collection in 1920 with the hair, Joseph or Hiram's hair, still intact. And another came into the collection from one of Wilford Woodruff's descendants. And the Church History Museum also has two canes. Both were on display last time Christine and I went, went to the museum. Um, the first was owned by Sidney Rigdon and was donated by Sidney's son. And the second cane was owned by Oliver B. Huntington. And this is the most elaborate cane I'm aware of. Still has the hair intact. And 
the display of the Church History Museum has a wonderful mirror set up so you can catch a, the best angle of the hair and the, and the full cane. Um, definitely worth the visit. The fifth cane is owned by Community of Christ and is on display at the Joseph Smith Historic Sites in Nauvoo. Uh, when Chris and I were guides there in 2011 or 10, uh, we had the opportunity to hold this beautiful cane. Um, uh, it's just a very simple cane, but it was a, a really neat experience. Thank you for joining us. If you haven't subscribed yet, please do so. Next time we'll be learning about prayer circles as once held outside the temple. Um, I think you're going to find it interesting. We'll see you then. See you then.